Hi, I'm Corey. About a month ago, I was asked to give a short talk to some Penn State students about what I thought was an example of an intriguing use of matrices. Oh yeah, and I had to do it in under five minutes. That led to this, an introduction to quantum computation, in five minutes or less. But don't start that timer just yet, because this presentation begins with a story. On May 3rd of 2016, IBM opened, by invitation only, their first ever quantum processor to the public. I jumped on it. Who wouldn't? And three days later, to my delight, I received this invite in my email. I figured, since I knew so many classical programming languages, and had taken tons of mathematics classes, programming a quantum computer would be a piece of cake. Right? You can imagine my surprise when I opened the interface. This is IBM's Composer. It's basically where you do all of your programming, but to me, it was the place where you stare in confusion. It turned out that none of my classical experience applied to quantum programming. I needed help. But I wasn't going to give up. So I found this course from a small, unknown university. I hit that course hard, and in two weeks, I was finished and happily playing around with IBM's quantum processor. My intro to quantum computation in five minutes or less owes a great deal to that course. The next five minutes will be quick and to the point, and without Erwin Schrodinger's little kitties roaming around every frame. Now you can start your timer. So let's start from the beginning. As you probably know, quantum computers use qubits. Whereas a classical bit can hold either 0 or 1, a quantum bit can hold a combination, what we call a superposition, of 0 and 1 at the same time. The coefficients have to follow this constraint, which is because when you measure the qubit, the probability that it comes out as either 0 or 1 is the square of the magnitude of the coefficient. In effect, this means that you can represent the qubit as a unit vector in C2. So that's quantum bits. Let's talk about quantum gates. What are quantum gates? Quantum gates are matrices, and they are unitary, which means that they have the property that their inverse is the same as their conjugate transpose. This has the interesting side effect that with the exception of measurement, all quantum operations are reversible. So let's look at a few common quantum gates. The Pauli X gate is the equivalent of a classical NOT gate. It looks like this, and right away you can probably see why it's a NOT gate. The Pauli Z gate is a gate that doesn't really make sense in classical computing. It's called a phase flip gate, and it looks like this. The Hadamard transform is a gate that's really important in quantum programming because it turns a normal 0 or 1, a classical state, into an equal superposition of 0 and 1. It looks like this. So that's how you talk about a single qubit. What about multiple qubits? You use something called the tensor product. And the tensor product is exactly what it sounds like. You're literally multiplying the states. And then you have to normalize it because, remember, quantum states have to be unit vectors. So that means that any two single qubit states can be multiplied into a multi-qubit state. You're probably asking yourself, does this go in reverse? Can I take any multi-qubit state and decompose it into its constituent single qubit states? No! Some states are completely unfactorable. Quantum physicists have a word for these kind of states. They call them entanglement. The classic example of entanglement is called the Bell state, and it looks like this. So now that I can describe a multi-qubit state, I can talk about the other extremely important gate in quantum mechanics. It's called the c naught gate, and it's the quantum equivalent of a classical XOR gate. It looks like this, and what it does is, in the part of the first qubit that is 0, it leaves the second qubit alone, and in the part of the first qubit that is 1, it flips the second qubit. It applies the Pauli X gate to the second qubit. One of the great things about quantum computation is that you can effectively execute both halves of an if statement at the same time. So why is this the other extremely important gate in quantum mechanics? Well, what happens if you give it this state? 
You've applied the Hadamard transform to the first qubit, so it's in an equal superposition of 0 and 1, and you've left the second qubit alone, so it's 0, for a combined state that looks like this. When you do the multiplication, it comes out as the Bell state. So that means that with the Hadamard transform and the CNOT gate, you can create entanglement. And entanglement is the reason quantum computation is so powerful. So anyway, that's the end of my little presentation. If you decided to time me, now is the time to stop the clock. Any questions? Hopefully not, but if you do, check out these resources. I found UC Berkeley's CS191X, Quantum Mechanics and Quantum Computation, incredibly helpful. When I received my invitation from IBM, I took the course from edX. Unfortunately, it's currently not available there. However, all of the video lectures are available on YouTube at this link. It would appear that nearly every lecture video is in the playlist. What you will be missing are all the problem sets. Hopefully, edX will bring this course back sometime soon. IBM has, thankfully, vastly improved their user guide since that fateful day when my invitation came. It's actually an excellent resource now. There are plenty of great tutorials available there. In addition, Microsoft recently released their Quantum Development Kit. Once you download this SDK, you can head back to the site for plenty of tutorials on Microsoft's quantum programming language, q -sharp. So, dig in! Check out the resources! But whatever you do, Try not to kill too many cats.